So I'm very glad to be here. And I, speak, I will speak about uh, a joint work uh, with people of, of my lab, PhD student as well as researcher. And it concerns uh, something which comes very late in the analysis of microarray. So first you have the pre-processing and you have to pre-process your data correctly. Then you most of the time you are doing uh, differential analysis or, or you use supervised learning to extract a list of genes. And then what I will present concerns uh, the research of interaction between uh, genes. By interaction, I mean uh, the research of genes, pair of genes which are co-expressed. So in, in the co-expression, you can uh, find sometimes regulation. But sure, don't expect to build your regula regulatory network from uh, rough uh, microarray data. So uh, usually uh, we have uh, 10 chips, or when you are rich, uh, 100 of uh, microarrays. And if you are studying um, the human genome, you have spotted on your arrays um, more than 20,000 uh, probes. So if you want to find uh, a few gene, a few pair of genes which truly interact, you first have to be modest and to limit the number of genes because and even uh, when limiting the number of genes, you have this problem of high dimensional, dimensional setting. That is, you have more genes than uh, the number of samples. So the basic hypothesis is that we will find interaction between genes that are really uh, expressed uh, in the experiment you are considering. So first, we select a few interesting genes, we call P, and P uh, is usually of the order of the number of uh, samples of microarray. Um, you, you can have, uh, for example, let's say five times more genes than uh, experiment, but that's the upper limit. Uh, let's say as many genes as experiments, that's more reasonable. And then, uh, from this uh, reduced data set, we want to infer interaction. So, most of the time, when you consider a microarray, you have different uh, conditions you compare. So, for example, you have uh, RNA uh, extracted, uh, which f f treated with drug one, with drug two, with drug three. And what people do, because of the scarcity of data. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, the, the good way to, to do it, usually, uh, is to infer one network per condition. Because the assumption, the statistical assumption, is that in a given condition, the distribution, statistical distribution, will be the same. But, and then, you can try to uh, estimate your parameter and your interaction in a given condition. But if you consider two conditions, there are no reason to find the same interaction in the two conditions. So the good way to do it, which is almost never done, would be to infer one network for each condition. But as the data is scarce, people tend to gather all the data they have and run the algorithm and infer a nice network. So we propose to have an in-between. That is, we assume that even if you change uh, the condition, uh, not everything is changing. You have a core of interaction remaining, and a few interactions will be different according the condition you are considering. So that's what we call multitask learning. 
and you infer one network per condition, but there is a strong using all the data available. So that's what I, I will uh, speak about. So we use very simple methods and very simple uh, assumption. The first assumption is that among all possible interaction, only a few are uh, effective. So if you compute all possible interaction uh, with your p gene, so for each pair of gene, you can have an interaction. So that's that, that will, that will p square interaction. And, and then it's not reasonable to have so many interactions, so we assume that there are only a few. And the second assumption is that uh, gene work uh, in family. That is, there are a group of genes which behave in the same way. But you don't know where are the group. So we try to find a structure of group to help the inference uh, process. And we consider two kind of uh, ships, classical ships and uh, time cost data. And when we consider time cost data, I, I will explain why, we have directed uh, interaction uh, and we, when we consider steady state data, we have undirected interaction. So you don't know which gene, uh, in which direction go the interaction. So the outline of the talk will, will be the following. I will first present uh, the model we consider. Then roughly, because that, that's the most difficult uh, mathematical part, uh, but I, I, I won't go into the detail. I'm sorry there are too many equations. Uh, um, I'm sorry about that, but uh, I, I will try to, 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 you know, to smooth uh, the equation. Uh, and I will uh, end the talk with some experiments on simulated data, because the first thing that we do when we have a model is test if when the assumptions are true, your algorithm does well. If not, then you can forget it. And if it does well, uh, there is no reason uh, that it, you can go further, even if you are, have no guarantee that you will, you will do well on real data. Okay, so as we have uh, continuous data, and we don't know what uh, distribution to choose, we choose a Gaussian distribution. So we assume that one uh, microarray is a vector, so you put all the probe on one column, and that it has as many coordinates as the number of genes you have selected. So here we have P gene expression describing one chip. And we assume that this P gene expression are the realization of a Gaussian vector. Uh, when you have classical data, you assume that all the chips are independent, also it's obviously false. But, uh, it's, we don't know uh, what to do uh, without this assumption. And when you have time cost data, you suppose you have a simple, we suppose you have a, we have a simple time series. So the main point of the talk is this one. As a statistician, if you want to find interaction, you tend to consider um, co correlation. Okay, the interaction, correlation. But if we consider uh, basic correlation, we have a lot, many artifactual interaction. Because if a gene A uh, controls gene B and C, so you will have correlation between A and B, A and C, but also you will observe with the, with the data you have a correlation between B and C. And you don't want that. So what we consider, and what everybody tend to consider, everybody, uh, every statistician in the field tend to consider now, is uh, conditional dependence, that is, 
correlation between two genes knowing all the other. So when you consider the correlation between gene B and C, you do it conditionally to the knowledge of A. And if there is no correlation between B and C, you won't see a relation between B and C. So th this story of partial correlation is only a way to get rid of a lot of connections that are not really there. Okay, so the main point is we draw a line between gen I and gen G, G if and only if there is a, a dependence, a conditional dependence between the two gene expression. And as we consider a Gaussian distribution, this conditional dependence means a non-nil partial correlation between the two expressions. And if that's a little bit more complicated, but that's the same principle, we consider time course uh, data. We have a relation between the two genes if we have a conditional dependency between the expression of the gene uh, I at time t and the, the gene G at time t minus one. So the state uh, of the gene a time of the G, uh, let's say one day, no, not one day, it's not a good time scale, uh, uh, one minute before, has an influence about the state of gene I one uh, minute after. Okay. So, uh, following uh, Fisher uh, and uh, uh, the classical uh, statistics, uh, we want to estimate the interaction, which are a parameter of our model, using a maximum likelihood approach. So we want to have the parameter which is, which maximizes the likelihood. But <coughs> the, uh, doing so uh, has some problems, because as we have more gene than uh, the number of uh, experiments, most of the time, this problem has no solution. So what we do is we had a small part here, which we called a penalization, and which depends on the parameter and the structure, that is the families of the gene. So if you are a Bayesian statistician, if your religion is Bayesian, uh, then you will call this term your prior. So this part of the criterion uh, is called the likelihood. That model is a clustering, the, the families present of gene present of the network. And the penalization has three uh, different kinds of function. First, it allows to have a solution. <laughs> That's a good point, because without this part, you have no solution uh, which you possibly can compute. And then we choose a special form of penalization which allow to select a few gene, a few interaction among all possible. Uh, and we select a few gene which are res uh, respectfully of the families of the gene we found on the network. I, I hope the, 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 it, it will become clear with the other slides. So let's take the simplest uh, case, the classical data. With classical data, we have so our microarray, which we consider to be uh, the realization of a normal uh, distribution with zero mean and a covariance matrix. So here we have one experiment, two experiments, n experiments, so n microarrays. The thing is that in the Gaussian context, if you consider the inverse of the covariance matrix, you have what we call a concentration matrix, and it, it is known that this concentration matrix 
is closely related to what we are interested in. We, had, we are interested in the partial correlation between gen i and gen, and gen G, j, knowing all other genes, and it's a simple function of the, the entry tt i j. And the, uh, and the other entry here. So, practically, if there is no connection between gene I and gene G, then your coefficient, theta IG, will be a zero. So what the, the whole point is to find where we have zero entry in this matrix. So, the first uh, basic idea that, is, that works really well was presented by uh, Miners and, and Billman in 2006, and it's the following. They use classical regression. They said, okay, we will try to predict the expression of gene I using all other genes and we will try to predict the expression of gen i as a linear combination of all other genes. For example, gen 3 is, uh, the expression of gen 3 is two times the expression of gen 1 plus five times the expression of gen uh, 4, etc. And then, doing so, all the coefficient of the, your linear combination I called them beta, it's a vector. And you can show when you are in the Gaussian context that there is a, a relation between beta and the entry of your matrix. So if gen G does not participate to explain the expression of gen I, beta will be zero and theta ig will be zero. So what they propose to do is to take all the genes they are, you are interested in, and for each gene, do a regression. And look then where the zero are. The problem of this approach is that, one of the small problems is that if, if you are doing so, you are doing p regression, and when trying to explain gen i, maybe you find that gen g uh, explain uh, the expression of gen i. And when you are considering the reverse problem, explaining gen j with gen i, maybe you find it doesn't explain, gen i doesn't explain gen g. So in one direction you find an interaction, and in, in the other direction you don't find it. So you have to take a decision and most of the time, you take an end or or decision. So you, you decide, for example, to, that's, that's what they propose. But if you are using a classical regression, you won't be able to solve your problem because of your high setting uh, context. So they propose to use what is called the lasso. So that's the classical least square regression problem penalized with the sum of the absolute value of the vector beta. Uh, why the sum of the absolute value? Because you want a few parameters, and, and this kind of penalization has a side effect of putting a lot, a lot of putting some of the parameter to zero, exactly to zero. Uh, I should have uh, a, sli a slide to explain it, but believe me, <laughs> so first it allows to solve the problem and then it sets a lot of beta to zero. Okay, we showed that uh, their approach, uh, don't, don't consider this, this part, could be considered as uh, the maximization of what we call the pseudo likelihood not the likelihood, but something close to the likelihood. And that instead of considering p different problem, you can consider one unique problem with 
this term being not that, that complicated. And when you see things like that, you say, OK, why do I have to consider the pseudo likelihood and not the likelihood? And that's a question uh, you, you can ask for, because the likelihood is a very simple and simpler form, has a, uh, has a simpler, simpler form. So if you consider the likelihood, the only thing which is important is the covariance matrix, the empirical covariance matrix. And the, the log likelihood is a simple function of the parameter you are interested in and of the empirical covariance matrix. And if you are rich enough to have a lot of microarrays, you, you can have the standard solution, which is the computation of the inverse of the standard empirical uh, covariance matrix. But as you cannot compute this, you have to rely on regular regularization. So what some people proposed is instead of considering the pseudo likelihood, consider the likelihood penalized with the same kind of uh, term. So here, that's the sum of all the absolute value of your uh, matrix. And that uh, problem as a, as a unique solution, which, which was, uh, this, this problem was first described by Banerjee and taken by Friedman and Tipsharani and all. Uh, they propose to solve it using uh, what they call the graphical lasso, which is a variant of the lasso. And the amazing thing is that they were published before uh, the, uh, the author of this paper. So they, they had the basic idea and they changed the algorithm and they produced an efficient algorithm, but they were published uh, a few months before. Okay, and, and, and we propose to uh, modify this approach, taking into account a structure in the gene. So saying that, okay, there is a structure, there are families of gene, and knowing how this family are structured will help to find a proper penalty. Okay, and we... Uh, yes, uh, noted that you can use this kind of penalization with a pseudo likelihood if you want to. Yes? Yes. No, no, what, what, I, what I said uh, is uh, uh, that method gives the same zeros than this one. And, and, and uh, when you consider this method with the li log likelihood and the pseudo log likelihood, you have some differences. Not many, but it depends on, on the, the level of, dif of uh, difficulty. If you have a simple problem, you won't have any difference. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, they, they agree most of the time, but there are differences. The, the maximum is not on, on exactly on the same place. Okay. Oh, yes, I, 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 I forgot it. Uh, I, I wanted to convince you to try this kind of approach, and we have a, I, I will present it uh, at the end. We have a, a software coded in R, which is really easy to use, and if you have your microarray data uh, and uh, a few genes of interest, you can test it very quickly. But you, so for time cost data, uh, we have the simplest model you can imagine. We say that the gene at time t, are the expression of, of the gene of time t are a linear combination of the gene the expression of the gene of t uh, at time t minus 1. And we are, we are doing very simple assumption to have the, the simplest model uh, among uh, all, uh, uh, all the autoregressive models. So I, I won't go into the details, but 
the thing is, this matrix has the same uh, role than the theta matrix uh, for the steady state data. So here, we are interested, again, in finding the zero of this matrix. And even if the problems are slightly different, the algorithm are really, really uh, close. So uh, I won't uh, spend too much time on, on this equation, so, but uh, it's easier to understand here. Here we have five genes, and that's uh, the initial time, the second time, the third time, etc. And one strong hypothesis assumption is that the interaction between time one and time two and time two and time three are the same. So it may be not uh, very uh, uh, relevant uh, when, consider when considering real data that the interaction are the same across the time. So some people uh, in the lab uh, have proposed to have breakpoint where the interaction change. But if you want to do statistics, you have to rely on some kind of repetition. So, okay. so that's the assumption we have here. Here, the quanti quantity of interest uh, are two, the same than before, the uh, within time covariance matrix, so the covariance between uh, the gene expression at the given time, and the across time covariance matrix. So the likelihood has a simple, has a relatively simple form, and if you are rich enough to have a lot of experiment, you can have your solution expressed in the following form. So the inverse of the within time covariance matrix multiplied by the across time covariance matrix. But as you are not rich enough, you have to rely on regularization, and we use the same kind of regularization. Okay, the major difference here is that you have a directed graph. Why? Because if you want to draw uh, an arrow between two genes, what we do is we collapse all the time together, and we see here that gene one controls gene two, and we have the direction that gene one controls gene three, uh, uh, sorry, gene one control gene one, uh, not control, it, it controls is not a good uh, word, uh, is linked to the expression of gene one, and gene one is linked to the, the expression of gene two and three. Okay. Okay. So we consider the same penalty, and to finish with the statistical model, if uh, we consider uh, multitask, that is different condition, we have most of the time two conditions, but you, you can have many more than two. Uh, let's say you have T sample concerning the expression of the same P gene. If you want to uh, consider the thing separately, you say, okay, I have one problem which is expressed across my T experiment, so what I want is T different networks. And what we do is we try to break this separality either by modifying this part or by modifying the penalty. So let's explore, right, let's explore the, the first uh, solution. We, we, we called it intertwined lasso. Instead of saying that all uh, samples are uh, completely independent, we say that what we are looking for is a linear combination, a convex combination of a matrix specific to the sample and a matrix specific to all samples. So we pull uh, the, solution, uh, the, the solution toward a global solution. 
And if you have uh, this coefficient set to zero, then that means that you are searching a global solution. And if it's set to one, that means that you are searching for T independent uh, solution. Another possibility we explored is what is called, it's, it's a classical approach, it, it, it what it's called, but not in this context, the group lasso. The group lasso aims at uh, setting uh, the parameter of a model to zero, but not independently. The group lasso, as uh, you can understand it w w with its name, consider groups of variable and it tends to put all the, variab the variable of one group to zero. So here, our group are defined by uh, uh, a given interaction. So you have an interaction between gen i and gen g, and you see it across, let's say, four samples. So you have a group of four possible interactions you want to consider. And what we, what, what we say is that either it's uh, absent across all the sample or it's present across all the sample without forcing it. We say it has a, a tendency to be present across all the sample or a tendency to be absent across all the sample. I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm clear. Okay. Okay, so, and uh, the, the trick is to change the penalty uh, and adopt this kind of form. So the, that's, uh, maybe I, okay, I, I won't spend that much time because uh, it cost uh, quite a, a lot of time to understand this, this uh, pictures. Uh, uh, here, uh, maybe I, I will only concentrate uh, on this one to explain the, the lasso, the uh, easiest one. So here we have uh, two uh, conditions, two tasks, and two interactions we are interested in. So it's not realistic, but uh, as uh, it's difficult to see in, in more than four dimension, uh, than three dimension. Here we have already four dimension. So if you consider, uh, for, for example, uh, task one, you have two interaction, interaction one and interaction two, and here that. Uh, in, in blue is where the solution is expected to be, where you constrain the solution to be. So when you consider a least square problem, you, you consider, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a, a solution which is a, parabolo uh, uh, a paraboloid, you have uh, you, you have uh, um, a function which has its minimum somewhere, for example uh, here, and which evaluates in, in this direction, and you are not interested in finding uh, the minimum of the function, but in finding the smallest value which is within the boundaries. And doing so, you have a great chances to find a minimum here, or here, or here, or here. And on this point in particular, you can see that here it means beta 2 equals to 0, and here it means beta 1 equals to 0. Well, I, I, uh, I, I propose to skip this, this part. It's too technical. and too te It's not te technical, but if you are not uh, uh, professional of the lasso, uh, you won't enjoy it. But, but, but my coworker was so proud of this picture that uh, he wanted absolutely to, because w once you are used to, uh, it's uh, a, a good way to go uh, in a practical understanding. But let's keep it. Okay, so let's speak about the overall strategy, which is uh, more e easy to, to grasp. Our basic approach is to maximize such criteria and the AG, so the interaction between the genes, they are described by theta. 
And the problem is, I didn't mention it, but it's a huge problem, is to find the right level of penalty. How to choose your lambda. The more uh, the penalty is, uh, the greater the penalty, the less interaction you are considering. So, uh, and another problem is to find the families of gene. So what we propose to do, so if you want to try it, you have only to Google uh, Simon and uh, CRAN. It's, it's on the CRAN, so the main R rep rep repository. What we do is we infer a family of network for a, a, a lot of uh, value of lambda. So we infer, let's say, s uh, hundred of networks one network for a given value of lambda, and then we select the best network according a given criterion. Once we have a useful network, we try to find families on this network, and we use the knowledge of these families to infer again the network. So it's a kind of iterative process which goes round. And finally, we have the network which was uh, selected using this knowledge of the families. So let's have an example. Here, that's uh, the truth. So that's a classical uh, picture. Uh, here you have uh, what we are looking for. That's the adjacency matrix. You have a black point when two genes interact, and the classical picture is that few gene, let's say uh, transcription factor, controls a lot of genes, okay? So here you see that those genes, they control a lot of genes. You see, you see what I mean? Do you? So here the row are genes, the columns are genes, and here that's uh, data across time these few genes control almost all the genes. So here there's two genes, they control almost all the genes. What we do is from the microarray, we infer a first uh, network, and then we cluster the network and find families of genes. Once we have the families of genes, we modify the penalty and infer again an adjacency matrix, which is closer to the initial one. So, to do the model selection, uh, you have there. There is a huge literature on model selection in this context. Uh, the amazing thing is that people um, writing this paper are mostly mathematicians. And they never, that's strange, but uh, for a statistician, they never consider real data. And they propose uh, given val uh, some value for lambda, but most of the time, all the propositions they have tend to be so conservative that you don't see any interaction. So you are sure to do, not to do any mistake. But most of the literature, which is uh, really theoretical here, uh, even if, if I exaggerate uh, a little bit uh, about the, uh, the fact that, that they are only theoretician, but in this context, it's useless. It's, key, it's not useless uh, in a theoretical point of view. It gives you an idea uh, of the order of magnitude, but if you want to have a, pricey, uh, a given uh, lambda, you don't rely on these approaches. So you could try to rely on cross-validation, but we know that cross-validation is optimal for predicting the values and not uh, doing the selection. Because we are not interested in the values of the correlation, we are interested in is there a correlation or is there not. H0, there is no correlation. H1, there is a correlation. Uh, that's okay. And we consider, so 
uh, the classical approach uh, in terms of uh, model selection, we consider two criterion, so the big criterion. First, we infer using our uh, penalization the, a given uh, theta parameter, and then we get rid of our penalization and use the big criterion to find among all possible lambdas which lambdas maximizes this uh, uh, criterion. Okay. Uh, concerning the latent structure, I will I, I won't spend too, too much time on it, but once we have a network, we use a clustering algorithm dedicated to network to estimate the families. So we have uh, our, our network, which is described by the matrix A. So there is a zero when there is uh, no interaction, for example, between uh, genes uh, six and gene eight, and a one when there is an interaction. And we are trying to find groups, so here are three groups, using very simple model. So each gene belongs to a family, that is a color, and we do only the assumption that uh, knowing the color, the genes are, the, sorry, the interaction are independent and follow a, a very simple law. So I, uh, I will skip the maximization uh, of, of this uh, criteria to go directly to the numerical experiment. But uh, the, the clustering part allow us to have this uh, families of gene. Okay, so let, let's see how it performs at first on simulation with uh, time course data. We simulated uh, 50 networks with 100 edges, and we considered time series of lengths 100. We had two classes of uh, genes, genes which we call hubs, which have a lot of connection, and genes which we call leaves, which have few, fewer connections. And we have a few hubs, which is usually the case, that's a property of network that you find in social network, in biological network, in, uh, on the web. There are always a few websites, people, genes, which are connected to a lot uh, of their, uh, uh, a lot of others. So, and we wanted first to see if considering the structure was an improvement or not. So here we have a box plot of the precision. So the precision that's uh, one of the criterion you are interested in when you are performing s such uh, an algorithm. So the precision that the number of true interaction your algorithm finds over the number of uh, true and false interaction that your algorithm gives. So here, that's the result of the, so what you want is to have a high precision. Here, that's the result of the uh, interaction we have without knowing the families of gene, and here, knowing the families of gene using the big criterion. And here, that's the same without the structure and with the structure using the IC criterion. And we see that there is a, quite a, an improvement when you try to find the structure. But anyway, we simulate the data in this uh, context. So we do the same for the recall. So for a statistician, the recall is an estimation of the, of the power, so that the true positive that your algorithm finds over the overall number of positive interaction. So, and the, that, that was, uh, I was saying uh, a few minutes ago, the basic test you consider is H0, there is no interaction between two genes, against H1, there is an interaction. And here again, we find 
so that the same plot, we find an improvement when considering here we don't consider the structure and here we consider the structure with BIC and with IC. And we see that there is no much difference between BIC and IC. And, uh, the third criterion uh, statistician is interested in is type one error, which is sometimes called here the fallout. That's a, the, the false positive over the non-interaction. And here again, we have the, you, you want the fallout to be as small as possible. And here again, we, with the structure, we have an improvement. So the second simulation, uh, you, you can ask question. Uh, I, uh, I'm aware I'm not uh, always uh, clear, maybe. So you, you can uh, ask question wh whenever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it, it makes a little more. Uh, it can. It, it finds uh, groups of genes which have the same connectivity pattern. For example, it can uh, do exactly what you say, having different connection patterns within cluster and between cluster. Or it can also, it depends on the network you consider, find hubs which have a kind of behavior and non-hubs or a mix of, of this sort of thing. But the, the principle is that, is the following. Uh, in a given class, in a given cluster, you have a connectivity pattern. And you use this we use this connectivity pattern to modify the penalty. So if we know that in a given family, there is a high connection of interaction, then we lower the penalty. That's, that's why we improve the, the result. And on real data, it works, it gives some improvement, not with this uh, within uh, between uh, case, because that, that's rare in, in, uh, on real data, but uh, with hub and leaves uh, model, because that's uh, more realistic. Okay, <coughs> so it's almost, okay. Uh, uh, it's almost the end before uh, before the evening party. So uh, now the the, the more complex uh, multitask framework. Let's say we consider uh, an ancestor network, so that's a basic network, and that's the reality, the truth that we can we, we want to find, and for each. Uh, condition, you have perturbation of this network. And so we, for each ancestor, we build four children, modifying a given number of ages. That, that was our, our assumption. So here, for example, I will have four children, four different networks, which have a common ancestor. And uh, we draw two types of curves, precision recall. Precision uh, was uh, already introduced, uh, recall also. Precision recall curves are preferred to rock curve because they focus, uh, they give a better description of uh, situations which are more interesting for us, situations where the true positive are small because you, you, you want to be, you, you want try to find a lot of true positive because if, if you go for all true positive, for a great number of true positive, you will have a, a great number of, of false positive. So that's why we, we prefer that kind of curve, but I, I plot the two curves. And we try to uh, infer the four networks with the pool strategy that is putting all the data together, and, oops, sorry. Uh, putting the data together, considering independent sample, and with the three strategy, uh, I, I presented only two. Uh, sorry, th that was the most original one, but uh, the most complex one in terms of criteria. But strategy taking into account uh, this in-between solution. 
And we, s we see that with our simulation, for sample of size 25 and small perturbation, delta equal to 1 means that there is a difference of one interaction, more or less, between the ancestor network and the children network. We see that the strategies of pooled and independent perform poorly compared to the three others, if the size of the network is small. And if you grow the size of the network, uh, sorry, here, then if all strategy will perform, will tend to perform the same. So, wh yeah, what it's, for example, here for for uh, hundred uh, for samples of size hundred, all strategy are almost equivalent uh, for for the the precision uh, we are uh, interested in. Okay, well, let's. I, I will go to the. I will. F I want to have time to two minutes to f finish on uh, the real data uh, and the demo. So we took uh, a classical uh, breast cancer data from the HES uh, paper. Uh, so it considered two types of patient. Patient, uh, so it aims at predicting the outcome of preoperative chemotherapy. We have a uh, patient we which, which respond completely to the uh, chemotherapy and, and patients uh, which still have a residual disease. And there are a lot of patients. So here we were very lucky. Uh, we had uh, 133 uh, patients and we focus on only 26 uh, genes. So if As I was not sure that R was available, I made a, a small movie. That's okay. yeah. so. Does it work? Ah, that's. I think that's a, that's the next one which is working. Okay, I I, I will try to go back. Okay. So th that's R for the one who are familiar with. And the library is called Simon. The data is called cancer. And if we go looking into the structure of the data, we have all our genes and the last uh, column which describe if the patient is uh, uh, responding completely or not. So here what I do is I get rid of the factor I get rid of the last column and keep only the gene expression in the matrix X. It has all the expression put together have roughly a normal shape. And now I infer the network. And here what we could see is that there are hundreds of network inferred. So among all the network, we choose one network with our information criterion. And well, I will skip this part about the regulation pass because, because it's. And what we could do is see which interaction appears in the time. Uh, you can go backward and, and, and forward. But uh, that, that's a, a nice tool, but uh, not that useful. What you want to do is to find a given network. So among all the network, we extract one, which corresponds to a network with 30 interaction. Plotting the network, we have that kind of structure. In blue, that the negative correlation, and in red, the positive correlation. So there are many ways to, to display the network. But now, we can try to find a structure in the network. And to find a structure, uh, you only have to say for which number of interaction you will go and searching the families. So here, 
we say, okay, we try to find families for 30 interactions, and we run Simon with the expression data saying we want clustering. So we have all the network uh, estimated. And then from all the network, we extract the network with 30 interaction. Plotting the graph, we have the kind, that kind of graph where the color of the gene shows the families. So we have genes which are not connected and families which are quite separated. And th then you can go for the interpretation of uh, the families of, of genes. And uh, I don't remember this this last one. Okay, yeah, and a useful tool is to look. So that's the patient uh, which respond completely, patient which respond uh, not completely, and looking for the difference between the networks, the intersection, and which interaction are different. So, okay. It's finished. So to sum up, uh, I wanted only to give a hint about uh, presenting this kind of uh, analysis. If you want to try, you, you have to download uh, the small uh, software. And we have all our uh, algorithm, but you, we have also the algorithm of uh, uh, Friedman, uh, Tipsherani, uh, uh, and all the paper I presented. Okay, and, and uh, currently we are finishing uh, to add a, a few useful tools as uh, interface to gene ontology. And the main thing is network comparison, uh, trying to put p-values on the interaction to know if an interaction is really uh, truthful or, or not. Okay, uh, I finished.